भगवते वासुदेवाय So today we have some time, we'll read from the Bhagavad Gita and have a little bit of a discussion. Uh, nowadays in the world, the big news is the cost of living is going up. Is it true? It's get, everything's getting more expensive, isn't it? It's more expensive to maintain a home, it's more expensive to buy food, it's more expensive to send your kids to school. Everything is becoming more and more expensive and sometimes people say it's becoming a struggle to live. Sometimes we think, why is the material world so hard? Why can't it be easier? Do you, put your hands up if you'd like life to be easier sometimes. Yeah, it's a struggle, isn't it? Sometimes to just survive in this world is so difficult, cost of living. But actually the material world is meant to be like this. Actually the material world is a prison. All of you are prisoners, me included. We're all in prison. So if you, say, if you come to the prison guard one day and you say, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, something wrong, the, the door is jammed, the door doesn't open. Maybe you need to call the maintenance man, the door, no, no, you're in jail, the door is locked. <laughs> there's no mistake there. Or if you say to the prison guard one day, no, no, I think there's a mistake, no one brought a menu today for what to eat. Do you guys keep bringing the same thing every day, there, someone's making a mistake here. No, no, you're in prison, there's no menu, you eat porridge. You porridge in a Hare Krishna temple as well, but anyway, that's a different story. So some things we have to accept is a part of life, because we're living in the material world, and what does Krishna say? Material world means it has two basic qualities, dukalayam. Some of you are from Indian backgrounds, you know the word alaya, isn't it? Like you say, vidyalaya means a place of knowledge. Granthalaya means a place where there's many books, a library. Bhojanalaya means Hare Krishna temple, <laughs> place of food. No, more than that, Govindas. Yes, a restaurant, Bhojanalaya. So material world is dukalaya, the place where there is duk. No matter what you try to do, there will always be unhappiness here. It doesn't matter what arrangements you make. And Krishna says, Ashashvatam. Everything is temporary. Everything disappears. Everything will be taken away in time. Have you noticed? Your health goes. Your wealth goes. Your hair <laughs> goes. <laughs> That's why I'm wearing a hat. <laughs> Your memory goes. The people you love go. Everything leaves in time. Why do you think Krishna takes everything away? Krishna is known as Hari. Understand? Hari. Hari means one who takes away. He takes away everything. Why? Why does he take away everything? Because he wants you to see, he wants you to know that all of these things are not you. All of these things are not what will bring you happiness. All of these things are simply temporary arrangements. So Krishna, what he does is he takes things away so that eventually we will realize what stays, what is eternal. What is permanent? What is real? Let me focus on that. So Krishna teaches us in many, many ways. Some people have to learn by experiencing, isn't it? You have to learn by going through some difficult situation. But if you're more intelligent than that, then you learn from observing you'll see others go through difficulty and you'll just learn from them. 
But if you're more intelligent than that, then you will learn from hearing. Just by hearing Krishna, you will grasp the lesson. Then you don't need to go through any experience of this world. Therefore, every day, those who are on the spiritual path, they read spiritual literature. Because this is Krishna giving all the lessons you need to learn in life. The Bhagavad Gita is not just a book from 5,000 years ago between two people who are removed from our life. No, this is the book which answers all the questions that everyone can ask at any time in their life. And so if we learn the lessons from the book, then we save ourselves a lot of pain and difficulty in this world. Just like when Krishna is in Vrindavan, then Krishna has many, many cows, isn't it? Krishna's name is Gopal, one who c protects the cows. Govinda, one who gives pleasure to the cows. So Krishna, he has many, many cows and he knows every single one of the cows' names. That's amazing. And when Krishna wants to call them back in the evening because he's going back, to uh, Nandagram where he lives then the first thing he does is he calls out their names come back Dhavali, Shamali, come back but then if they don't come back by hearing their names then you know the next thing Krishna does he, uh, he plays his flute but then if they don't come back by hearing Krishna's flute, then the next thing Krishna does, you know? He sounds a buffalo horn. It's louder. But then if they don't hear by Krishna's buffalo horn, then you know the next thing Krishna does? Then he gets the stick out. <laughs> and then he chases them back. So how do you want to come home? How do you want to come home? By the sound of Krishna's flute? and Krishna's sweet words or do you want to uh, have Krishna chase you with a stick <laughs> the school of hard knocks so therefore if we can understand some of the lessons here then we can save ourselves a lot of difficulty is it I agreed it's worth it's worthwhile to try to understand so let us read from the Gita today we'll do something slightly different uh, you will choose what we speak about. So I'm going to ask you, and uh, Jayananda Prabhu, mm -hmm. can you name me a number between 1 and 18? 15. 15. They say if one chooses the low numbers, they're very humble. <laughs> <laughs> if they choose the high numbers, they're confident. <laughs> and if they choose the middle numbers, they're balanced. He's a confident man. Fifteen. Okay. So let's read from chapter number fifteen and uh, let's just see here how far we're going. I can't remember how many verses there are. Twenty. Yeah. All right. So, sir, so between one and twenty, can you give us a number? Eight. Eight. See, so we went for the middle number. <laughs> Balance balanced man okay let's read from text number 8 from the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita it's very interesting chapter 15 because what Krishna does in the 15th chapter is he explains that this world is a reflection of the original world Krishna says the original world is like a banyan tree have you ever seen a banyan tree anyone yeah, probably not in Ireland, <laughs> but maybe in India. Banyan tree is very, very complex. You know, like when a banyan tree, it has roots. Sometimes you can find the roots one, mil one mile away because the roots go in all directions. So banyan tree is very complex. So Krishna says the original form of the banyan tree is in the spiritual world. But when you see a tree and there's a river, then what do you see in the river? A reflection. So Krishna says the original form of the tree is in the spiritual world, but when that tree is reflected on the river of material desire, then a reflection of the tree is created. 
In other words, Krishna says, as soon as the soul has a material desire, then the material world is the place that they enter into. So put your hands up if you have a material desire, even one. Okay. And for the rest of you, we'll do a seminar on truthfulness. <laughs> uh, everyone has material desire. You cannot say you do not have. Otherwise, you wouldn't be existing in this world. So Krishna says this world is a reflection. So that's in itself, that's an interesting concept because it means everything you see here exists in the spiritual world. But in the spiritual world is perfect. In the material world, there is marriage. That means in the spiritual world, there's also marriage. But in the spiritual world, <laughs> I better be careful where I go here. <laughs> there's none of the problems that come with marriage. Do you have some problems in marriages sometimes? Not sometimes, it can happen. In the material world, you have cars transport isn't it they break down you get a speeding fine someone scratches your car in the spiritual world there's also transport but there's none of those problems in the material world there are relationships but sometimes the relationships people let you down isn't it people break your heart last christmas i gave you my heart <laughs> but the very next day we threw it away. So, people hurt you. But in the spiritual world, there's relationship, but everyone is so kind, everyone is so generous. So this world, this chapter is all about Krishna describing the material world and the spiritual world. So this is what Krishna says in text number 15. Uh, sorry, chapter number 15, text number 8. So I'll read the Sanskrit and then I'll read the English and then we'll just have a discussion. Shariram yad avapnoti yachapyukramateshvara grihitvetani shamyati vayur gandhani vashayat. Translation. Try to listen carefully. The living entity in this material world carries his different conceptions of life from one body to another as the air carries aromas. Thus he takes one kind of body and again quits it to take another. Understand the gist of what Krishna is saying? We are an Atma and we're going from life to life. And just as air carries aroma, isn't it? If the air goes over a flower field, then it carries the aroma of flowers. But if the air goes over a dump yard, then it carries the aroma of rubbish. The air is carrying different conceptions, different smells. So similarly, the soul is carried by the subtle body and it carries its mentality from a previous life. Therefore, when we all enter this life, we all have different personalities, isn't it? Some people are loud, some people are quiet, some people are confident, some people are not. Some people are very analytical, some people are more simple. Everyone is different. Because we all did different things in the past and we're all here now. So this is Srila Prabhupada's purport. Here the living entity is described as Ishvara, the controller of his own body. If he likes, he can change his body to a higher grade. And if he likes, he can move to a lower class. Minute independence is there. The change of his body undergoes, the change his body undergoes depends on him. At the time of death, the consciousness he has created will carry him on to the next type of body. If he has made his consciousness like that of a cat or a dog, he is sure to change to a cat's or dog's body. And if he has fixed his consciousness on godly qualities, he will change into the form of a demigod. And if he is in Krishna consciousness, he will be transferred to Krishna Loka in the spiritual world and will associate with Krishna. It is a false claim 
that after the annihilation of this body, everything is finished. The individual soul is transmigrating from one body to another, and his present body and present activities are the background of his next body. One gets a different body according to karma, and he has to quit this body in due course. It is stated here that the subtle body, which carries the conception of the next body, develops another body in the next life. This process of transmigration from one body to another and struggling while in the body is called Karshati, or the struggle for existence. Death is not a full stop. Death is just a comma. Death is the gateway to the next life. Gate, death is the beginning of a new chapter of existence. Therefore, all of us here in this room, we were here before. Maybe not in Dublin, maybe we were. But we were all in the material world before, in a different body, in a different situation. And according to our activities, somehow or other, we ended up in this body. Everyone enters this world with a different body. And they say in the Shastra that there are four things which are indicative of your karma of previous activities. The first one is known as Janama. The family and your upbringing is a reflection of your previous activities. The second thing is Aishwarya. What does Aishwarya mean? Not the Hollywood actress. <laughs> wealth, opulence, how much wealth, how much opulence, how much uh, material facilities you have. This is a reflection of your previous activities. Shruta, what does Shruta mean? Knowledge, wisdom, how much intelligence you have. This is also a reflection of your previous activities. And Shri, what does Shri mean? Beauty. Beauty. Mirror, mirror, on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? Yes, beauty. If you have beauty, if you have physical attraction, then it means you have good karma from a previous life. So you begin to understand now that when we come into this world, we come in with different things. And this is a reflection of what we have done in our previous life. Some people don't believe that there is a previous life. They say we came from chemicals and at the end of life we'll go back into the ground. One time I was at university and one boy, one boy, he stopped me. He was campaigning for the Stop the War Coalition. So he gave me a leaflet and he said, we've got to stop the war, thousands of people are dying. So I looked at him and I said, what happens when we die? So he wasn't expecting that question. So after some moments, he said, we're just chemicals. We just go back into the ground. So then I said to him, so then what are you worried about? We could throw a Coke can into the sea or we could throw you into the sea and ultimately it's the same thing because that's chemicals, your chemicals. If everything's matter, nothing matters. So why are you so worried that people are dying if you say they're only matter? They said, no, 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 but they're alive. I said, well, yeah, but what makes them alive? And then he had to submit that, yes, we are more than matter. We are more than chemicals. We're more than just physical elements. We are spiritual beings. And therefore, as Newton said in the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Energy is always existing. So how can we say at the time of death, the energy of life is annihilated? No. The energy of life is carrying on. Have you ever met someone who remembered who they were in their previous life? Have you ever met anyone like that? Yeah, there are people. Have you ever had deja vu? Yeah. So sometimes people can remember their previous life. You can check it up on the internet. There's someone called Ian Stevenson. 
And you know what he did? He documented 5,000 cases of children who spontaneously remember their previous life. So when they're very, very young, they begin recalling, I was this person, I lived in this place, this was the name of my mother and father, this is how I died. And then what he does is he goes back in time and sees whether such a person existed. He's documented 5,000 cases of positive correlation. You know what he's even done? Sometimes he's even taken a child on, from one part of the world to another part of the world where they say they lived in a previous life. He's taken them there and they've been able to identify everything in that place, although they've never been there in this life. How is it possible? Yes, because we are going from one body to another. So here, Krishna is saying that we must understand that this life is just a chapter. This life is just one scene of the story. In life, we are always planning, isn't it? Have you noticed? Right now, you're planning. How will I make sure I get in the prashadam line before it all finishes? <laughs> because there's a lot of people here today. Uh, right now, you're already planning. Today is Sunday. Tomorrow is Monday. What will I do? Monday, I have to go to work. Maybe I'll work from home. Already now is January, but you're planning. What will I do in the summer? Where will I go on holiday this year? You're already planning. <laughs> Some of you are students. You're already planning. What will you do after you graduate? Some of you just got married. You're already planning. How may, when will I have children? Some of you have had children, you're already planning, when can I retire? <laughs> Everyone is always planning, but who's planning for death? Who's planning for after this life? Who's planning for the one sure thing that will happen to every single person in this world, which is that at one point they will breathe their final breath? That kind of planning no one is doing. Uh, therefore Krishna says that um, planning to fail means, uh, failing to plan means planning to fail. We must plan. So Krishna says, is giving us this reminder that yes, whatever conceptions, whatever desires, whatever we cultivate within our hearts and minds, this is what will carry us to the next destination. In the 8th chapter of the Gita, Krishna is talking all about death. Death is the inconvenient reality, the thing that nobody wants to talk about, the thing that everybody is avoiding. But actually for the spiritualist, death is the ultimate meditation. For a spiritualist, not a day goes by where they don't think about death. For the spiritualist, the mobile phone, is it this there? <laughs> That's fine, no problem, no problem. I did switch it off. Uh, yeah, sometimes it happens. I'm very sorry, so. That's fine. We'll Please. find you later. Please. <laughs> Thank you. It's a busy world, it's a busy world. So, uh, yes, in the 8th chapter, Krishna is explaining the science of what happens when we die. Amazing science. What happens when we die? So what does Krishna say? Antakale cha mameva smaran muktva kalevaram ya prayati samadbhavam yati nasyatra samsayaha Antakale, at the end of time, Smaran Muktva, as you give up your body, whatever you remember, Smaran, Ya Prayati Samad Bhavam, that nature you will attain. Uh, so whatever you think about at the time of death, that will determine your next destination. Basically, if you want to know 
How you end up in your next destination, basically there's three factors. Factor number one is what is your desire at the time of death. Factor number two is what kind of activities have you performed in this life. And factor number three is that if you are spiritually inclined, then Krishna will also add his uh, hand into it as well. These are the three factors. So let me give you an example. Say for at the end of your life, your desire is to, I'm just giving a very simple example. Your desire is to live in a really big house. Your karma, if you didn't do very good activities in this life, say your karma is quite bad. Then what will happen is that in your next life, you may become a dog in a mansion. So Krishna fulfills your desire, but according to your karma. Now, case number two, say I have a desire to live in a really big house, same desire, but now I have good karma, I gave a lot of charity, I was very kind, I was very um, pious, then in the next life Krishna may make you a millionaire and you own a mansion. Case number three, you desire to live in a big house, you have good karma, but also you're spiritually inclined and you tried to practice Krishna consciousness, so now Krishna is involved in your life, then what Krishna may do is in, the, in your next life you may take birth in a place like Bhaktivedanta Mana. <laughs> so you see, Krishna fulfilled your desire, but in a spiritual way. So do you see how whatever situation you are in now is a combination of all of these things. Your desires, your karma and your spiritual inclination. So Krishna is basically saying if you spiritualize your desires, if you spiritualize your activities and if you try to remember me throughout your life, then at the end you will remember. At the end you can't fake it, isn't it? When the spies used to come in from the German camp into the enemy areas, then they would learn the language perfectly so people wouldn't suspect that they're spies. But when the enemy camp suspected that this person is a spy, all they would do is they, when that person was walking through the door, they'd slam the door on their hand and their hand would get caught. And when the hand gets caught in the door, then you tend to speak some, you know, Scottish mantras <laughs> and when you speak those mantras they don't come out they come out in your original language because in that moment you can't you can't trick anyone when you squeeze an orange orange juice will come out you can't you know so we can't trick anyone so Krishna is saying that we have to be very very careful Right in this moment, every single day, every single activity, you're building your future. You're designing your destiny. Sometimes we think, oh, this little thing, that little thing, it doesn't matter. These are just small things. Every single thing is having an impact on your consciousness. So sometimes the seed of a material desire goes in one place and then later on that seed will come out in another place. But we don't make the connection. Everything is having an impact. So through the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is giving us a broader vision that we're on a bigger journey, that we have a bigger purpose, and that according to how we live, according to the habits that we develop, according to the desires that we cultivate, that will determine where we go in our next life. So the real question is, uh, do we want to come back to this world? Or do we want to go to a different place, a different nature? It's not a cheap thing. It's not an easy thing. Anything you did in your life required so much effort. Some of you are very high in your career that required incredible sacrifice and effort. Some of you brought up children that required great sacrifice and effort. 
Some of you did incredibly well in your exams and your academic that inquired that required great effort. Everything in this life requires effort. So until and unless we put great effort into developing our innate spiritual consciousness, we won't get there. We may make some advancement, but then again, Krishna is saying you'll have to come back to this world to carry on, to try to perfect it. But we don't want to come back to this world because as soon as you come back to this world, so many things can go wrong. So many obstacles can come up. So many complexities come into our life. We've all experienced it. So Krishna is saying, try to uh, perfect your consciousness in this life. We have so many responsibilities, but we can't forget that this is the most important uh, responsibility. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, rather than me just speaking and speaking, maybe I'll open it up and see whether anyone has any questions, any comments. Today we talked about reincarnation, about death, about desires, and about how all of this affects our life. Um, so yes, does anyone have any uh, questions you would like to ask or comments? Uh, yes. Sorry, would you? Personal communication. Yes. After that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. After. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Did anyone like ask any public questions? Okay. Yes. So you were given the example like right? there is. Um, according to your desires at the time of death and the kind of uh, qualifications you have, um, then Krishna reciprocates with you in a certain way. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so the third case was where the person is spiritually inclined. So somehow Krishna came to, into your life. So my question is, how does he come in your life? Like what's the thing that... Um, attracts you to become, um, to put Krishna to your life. I was thinking about Shukadeva Goswami. What <coughs> happened to him? How did Krishna come in his life? How did he get attraction to Krishna? Okay, thank you so much. So, the question is that when we have some spiritual desire, then at the end of life, Krishna is arranging for us our next destination. And so the question here is, how do we get that spiritual attraction in our next chapter of life to begin the journey again or to continue the journey? Well, that's why uh, spiritual people will come into your life. Spiritual wisdom will come into your life. Spiritual opportunities will come into your life. Um, in many people's case, they're born into a spiritual situation where they're exposed to these things from the very beginning. So for many of us, you know, the fact that you came across devotees of Krishna, the fact that you came across wisdom of Krishna, the fact that you're, uh, you receive some prashadam somewhere in some place, uh, it could just be great fortune, but more likely it's that you had some spiritual desire and some spiritual cultivation from a previous life and now Krishna just gives you some opportunity here to just continue it on. So in the case of Sukadev Goswami, yes. Remember when he came out of the womb, then he said, I don't want to get entangled in this world. I only want to just go and then he immediately left home. But then what did his father uh, Vyasadev do, he arranged for uh, Sukadev to hear verses from the Bhagavatam Ahobakiyam stanaka lukutam and when Sukadev heard these verses of the Bhagavatam he got attracted, he said I gotta come back and hear the full Bhagavatam so like that an arrangement will be made from Krishna that will come across something spiritual 
Krishna may also make an arrangement for us by making something go wrong in our life. That's another way in which Krishna brings you to Him. Uh, something, a life quake in your life, just like now there are earthquakes around the world. So in your life, a life quake may come. Someone may pass away, a health difficulty may come. Uh, a relationship may break and then in that situation then one looks up and tries to connect again so Krishna is very very kind Krishna makes different arrangements by which we trigger our spiritual consciousness and in everyone's life it will be different and if each one of us looked and reflected on our life then we will be able to identify points at which Krishna arranged things to trigger our spiritual journey. Okay. Yes. Thanks for the beautiful class, Maharaj. Maharaj, my question is two verses that Krishna says, Nagatvana Nivartante, that Dhamam Parvam Mama. So there are two questions. First, do we still also have free will in the spiritual world? And second question, if there is a free will, is it influenced by Krishna so that we don't fall again into this material world? Yeah, so in 15 num uh, cha text number 6, chapter 15, Krishna says, uh, Yadgatva na nivartante, that when you go back to the spiritual world, na nivartante, you never come back. So question number one, do we lose, does that mean we lose our free will? No, we can never lose our free will. Because free will is the one thing that Krishna gives us that he never takes away. Because without free will, there is no love. Love means it's from one's own volition. It's from one's own desire. It's from one's own voluntary um, giving of themselves. So no, we don't lose our free will. So then your next question is, if we don't lose our free will, does that mean Krishna is influencing our free will? If Krishna, I mean, that would kind of be the same thing. If Krishna was influencing us then, and we lose control of our, our own will. It's not even so much that. Srila Prabhupada once, uh, on, on different occasions, said the English dictum, once bitten, twice shy. So once the living entity has experienced this material world, then there's no desire to come back here again. Uh, but that's still entirely their own free will. So Krishna basically explains that once you go back to the spiritual world, um, the f complete freedom to do anything and everything is there. But now you are fixed in that consciousness, so basically the living entity will not misuse their free will again. However, I have to add a footnote on this. The question of how the living entity came to this world and how the living entity goes back to this world is a complex question which is multidimensional. And basically we can't answer it in a linear narrative and I'll explain why if you imagine this is the time scale of earth understand then as you go higher and higher in the universe time dilates isn't it so that when you are on Brahma Loka which is a higher planet then you know one day on Brahma Loka is like six months here so when you go even higher and you reach the end of the material world, you reach point zero of time. There's no more time anymore. And then when you go into the spiritual world, time functions but in a completely different way. Therefore it's said that in the spiritual world there's no time. So now let me ask you, how can you leave a place where there's no time? When did you leave? But you can't, there's no time there. And how can you go back to a place where there's no time? Because you were always there. So when we try to understand the leaving of the jiva and the entrance of the jiva into the spiritual world, our English language will always fall short because we're dealing with two different time dimensions. 
So some things can't be understood or explained by language. For example, if I say to you, who came first, the father or the son? Who came first, the father or the son? Father, of course, right? Of course, Other, without father, wrong, you're wrong. Because until the son was born, was the man a father? No, he was just a man. But when the son was born, he became a father. So I could say the father came before the son, which is true. And I could say the son comes before the father. And that's also true. But they're completely contradictory. That's fine. They're still correct in their own uh, context. In English, we say, actions speak louder than words. But then we also say, the pen is mightier than the sword. Which one is true? Both. In English, we say, birds of a feather flock together. But we also say, opposites attract. Which one is true? Both. So... When we're understanding matters of the spiritual dimension, we have to understand that linguistics and language have their limitation. Therefore, Krishna says, some things are achintya, inconceivable through mundane logic and argument. Is that okay? All right. Yes. Like uh, on death, actually. So we know we are going to die one day, but why we fear for death? Why not accept it happily? <laughs> we know that we're going to die, but why do we still fear death? Because we fear death when we don't know what's happening after death. We know we will die, but we don't know what's going to happen after. And that, become, that brings great fear, fear of the unknown. But when one is a devotee of Krishna, they know. Krishna is my best friend. Krishna is always with me. Krishna, rakshishyati ti vishwa show. Krishna will surely protect me. Therefore, for a devotee, because they know what will happen after death, there's no fear. But for one who doesn't have that, they know about death, but they don't know what happens after death. But a devotee knows about death, and they know what happens after death, and therefore there's no worry. So therefore, uh, because people don't know what happens after death, they try to forget about death. Did you know that 72% of people in this world die without writing a will? You understand? Will? They say, where there's a will, there's a way. And where there's a will, there's definitely a relative. <laughs> so people write wills. Huh? But 72% of people in this world die without writing a will. Why? Maybe they didn't want to think that one day I'm going to die. It's a depressing thing to think like all of these things. Now I have to give it, leave it to all these people. I don't even like them, you know. Now I have to leave it to this, leave it to Jayananda. <laughs> no, He's a nice guy. <laughs> so it depends. People don't want to. Or they, maybe they think, oh no, I'm, will is for old people. I'm not going to die. Someone else will die. All these guys will die. But I'm not going to die. Leo Tolstoy, he said, I know everyone has to die. But I was hoping an exception would be made in my case. No. Chinese proverb says, whether you're the king, the queen, or the pawn, at the end of the game, everyone ends up in the box. So we have to not just realize death and know about death, but become confident in Krishna's protection after, and then there'll be no fear. But that can't just be theoretical. You have to feel Krishna, you have to experience Krishna, you have to develop 
Vishwash, you understand? Not just Shraddha. Shraddha means faith. Vishwas means conviction. Definitely, Krishna will protect me. Yes? Okay, yes. So that, this was kind of what I was addressing with uh, Sugati Prabhu's question. Um, yes, we were. We were she, the way Srila Prabhupada explains it, he says, yes, we were in the spiritual world. And then at one point we had a curiosity. What would it, like to, what would it be like to be separate from Krishna? So Krishna, he doesn't lock up the spiritual world and say, no, no, no one can get out here. The spiritual world is not like Alcatraz, you know, like you, there's all these high walls and moats and, you know, like police on high towers making sure no one leaves. No, no. If you want to leave, Krishna says, OK, you can leave. So it seems as though that's the way Srila Prabhupada explained it. However, I'm going back to the point that I made to Prabhuji here that when we say we left the spiritual world, it's also kind of like a, a language which also is not 100% correct because uh, we, you're, you're talking about two different time dimensions. The spiritual world exists in a time dimension beyond uh, space and time as we know it. And then you're talking about, so you can't really, but yeah. So it's, uh, it's somewhat of an inconceivable question. Yes, Prabhu, you want to say something? Yeah, I just heard in a lecture that we were there, that's why Prabhupada started back to go ahead and Yeah. If we were there and we have to go back to where we came from. Yes, so yes. It seems, yeah. So, of course, in Srila Prabhupada's books you find, and his uh, body of works, you find different statements on this. But whichever one it is, the point is, you see, the other way Srila Prabhupada explained it is he said, when you're in a fire, you don't go around in the middle of the fire trying to figure out, like, who was responsible for this? <laughs> you don't start doing, a, you know, a, a police check of finding out, you know. Where, first and foremost, get out, get, the, get out. And then later on, maybe other things. So... Trying to figure out how we got here in the f first place is a sure way to give yourself a headache. So, we accept that, you know, this is somewhat inconceivable because even if I tell you, yes, you left the spiritual world out of your free will, you'll come back to me and say, but if the spiritual world is so amazing, if Krishna's there, if every step is a dance, every word is a song, why in the world would you leave? Yeah, I, I ask myself the same question sometimes. <laughs> Somehow, curiosity killed the cat. So we have a tendency to be curious. And then it gets us into a little bit of problems. What material illusion chow down to? Material illusion can't enter the spiritual world. Well, yes, it is, it, or yes. It so, so it's not really material illusion. So I, my question is, um, for, you know, I had the answer before. So if the so, yeah, so I understand your question. We have free will, otherwise we'd be automatons. But living beings fully satisfied that we're, he's always got that bit of free. Yeah. Will, so, so the way Shila Prabhupada explains it so is not so much. Fun said before, it said instant, you desire to be instant, you're still in, not in a state of ignorance, but, or illusion, but the instant you want to be separate from Krishna, you want to be your own Lord, so to speak, you go, and you start, you don't start off, you start your life in the material world as a higher demigod. Yeah, so it's explained in different ways. I mean, again, I don't want to go into the details of it because it's like, it's not a topic which I think, as I've been mentioning Sorry. here, that's why I gave the answer here, that 
I think our English language has its limitations when trying to understand some of these phenomena because we're dealing with different levels of reality and existence and we're trying to put it down as a linear narrative and you were there and then this happened and then this happened and now you're here and then eventually you'll go back and it's kind of like we're trying to map it out like that but if you try to do that it, it won't make sense because like yeah someone will say how can material illusion come into the spiritual world so but then it wasn't a, it's not an illusion yeah. it's just you decide to be yeah, it's a curiosity, exactly. You still, even if you leave the, yes. in the very high or heavenly planets, you're still worshipping Krishna, but you still want that tiny bit of your own mind made yes. independence, is it? Yes, yes, then you that's go the point. Something like that, I don't know. Can I ask another question? I'll just go here, we'll just give everyone a chance and then Sorry, I'll come sir. back, yeah? Um, and we should stop our curiosity. <laughs> 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 Look, curiosity is not a bad thing. But it can cause problems. Yeah, it can cause problems. Yeah, it can cause problems. Of course, Einstein, he said, never stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. So there's a sense in which curiosity is... Uh, is good within its boundaries you see like even in this world curiosity is good because curiosity can begin uh, your spiritual journey because you have to question you have to challenge you have to ask but at a certain point if you're constantly curious but you don't also quieten some of your curiosity at one point and practice then you also don't advance. You understand what I'm saying? So too much of anything is bad. Right? So too much curious. Like say for example, some people are curious. They, they visit like every spiritual place. They read every spiritual book. They, you know, go to every spiritual event. But they don't practice anything. So that's only going to take you so far. Imagine like if you opened your mouth and you just kept putting food in. Like that's good. But then at some point you've got to close your mouth and you've got to start chewing the thing. Right? So curiosity is like it opens you up to newer realities. But then at one point you've got to practice. So, yeah, so curiosity is good but in its measure, within a certain boundary, Otherwise, it can also be counterproductive. Uh, but in one specific case, like uh, of curiosity, like of uh, like asking questions, like questioning God, or like questioning some particular devta, like uh, about uh, if he has powers, like uh, how did he have, like why did he have that powers, like if he, like I can, I want to take example of Hanumanji, like. Uh, they were given at the time of birth, like they were given all the like uh, boons, uh, pow 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 powers boons, like, yeah, 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 cities. So, like, uh, <coughs> like if uh, we have that cities, we, are, we, we can also do seva for Sri Ramji, right? But, like, why did he got all the cities at the time of birth? Uh, I don't know, like, about the past time, but uh, like, did he did something good in his life that he got the chance to get that powers and uh, so. Yeah, when we're curious, like, it's not for us to question others, whether they be gods or whether they be other living beings in this world. When we're exercising our curiosity, we should focus on ourselves. Why am I in this situation? What does Krishna want me to learn from this? Um, what opportunities, what uh, weaknesses do I have? We should question ourselves more than questioning everyone and everything else. We should turn that curiosity within to ask ourselves about our journey, about our spirituality, about what we should do in our life to move forward. Because everyone is on their own journey, you know, and like we're talking about here in the Bhagavad Gita, we all came into this world from a different place with different things going on. 
So if you try to understand why, why did that guy get so much money and I didn't? No, but there's a whole history going on there. Yeah, so we should be aware of this. Yeah? Yes. So your faith is built upon three things <laughs> Philosophy, people and practice So if you want to become steady Deepen your understanding of the philosophy of Krishna consciousness Because what will happen is when you study books like the Bhagavad Gita When you discuss spiritual wisdom Then what happens is your intelligence becomes stronger And when your intelligence becomes stronger even when your emotions and your mind is going wild, your intelligence will be strong enough to control it. So the first thing if you want to become more determined is strengthen your knowledge of philosophy. The second thing if you want to become more determined is be around spiritual people because their determination, their faith, their strength, you will share in some of that, you will pick up some of that. And the other thing, if you want to become determined and steady, is practice. Practice the philosophy. Serve Krishna. Uh, make a sacrifice in uh, assisting Srila Prabhupada in this movement. Because when you practice, then what happens is Krishna becomes active in your life. Because you're serving Krishna, Krishna comes into your life. And when you feel the presence of Krishna in your life, then that increases your faith and your steadiness and determination. So those are the three things. Philosophy, people, and practice. And then you will become determined. Yes. Three Ps. Three Ps, yeah. Philosophy, people, that's easy to remember. Maharaj, we always talk about past life, karma, past present life. What do you say about people who are born in this world and let's say handicapped, handicapped disabilities? They aren't able to decide their karmas, what they are doing. How would the next slide be? So what about when someone is born in this life in a very difficult situation, some disability, um, they don't have they can't exercise their free will. So then what happens to them in their next life because it doesn't seem as though they're able to exercise any decision-making capacity. The first thing we should know about karma is that karma is not a concept we should use to judge others. This is, just, I'm, this is not related, just a side point. Karma is a concept that we use to introspect in our own lives. It's not for us to see someone who's suffering, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but someone who's suffering and say, yeah, that's because they did something in their previous life. No, it's not for us to make that judgment. That's between them and Krishna. But uh, we use karma to introspect into our own life. Otherwise, people use mis -karma, misuse karma and it becomes... Uh, yeah, something which doesn't empower and uplift others, but it makes them, you know. Now your question is that if someone can't exercise their free will because of some karmic limitation or some, you know, limitation in their life, then what determines their next life? You see, Krishna, when he's determining our next life, then he's taking all the factors into account. So he's seeing what kind of capacity you have when you made a certain decision, what situation was surrounding you, um, what your motivation was when you did that. So karma is not black and white. And so in a situation where someone doesn't have so much decision-making capacity, then we can understand that their ability to exercise their free will in that life is reduced. And therefore, Krishna in the next life will arrange for them to have another situation where they can exercise more of their free will and thereby go back to a higher destination. 
But one other thing I'll say is that sometimes with people who have limited capacity to express themselves, as in, for example, someone like a disabled child or so on and so forth, we should not underestimate their capacity still on an internal level to develop their consciousness. They may not be able to interact with the world, they may not be able to uh, express themselves to people around them, but that doesn't mean they don't have cognition and consciousness within. Therefore, if someone has a disabled child, but you still expose them to spiritual mantra, to spiritual wisdom, to love and affection, then that can still um, nourish their inner life in a way that they can gain great elevation to uh, in spirituality. So even in the case where someone has some severe impediment like that, it doesn't mean that their advancement and their progression towards the spiritual world is now blocked. They can still get great progression and spiritual advancement. So Krishna takes everything into account and if someone has limited capacity, Krishna recognizes that and he See, karma is meant to just help us go higher and higher and higher. So Krishna is always looking for a chance to bring us higher. I hope that helps. Yes, at Can the I back. Have two okay. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so one thing my sister who really wishes she could be here, but um, she wanted to ask, why do we sometimes feel guilty when we don't do enough in our spiritual practices? Um, is it like an indication of how much we care, or is it just us being harsh on ourselves? So how do we, why do we feel guilty when we don't do enough in our spiritual practices? Guilt is not a bad thing. Guilt is actually a very good thing if it inspires us and enthuses us to then go on and do more. Guilt becomes a bad thing when it becomes so much of a predominant emotion that it kind of, we drown in that guilt and then we just feel hopeless and helpless. So a healthy amount of guilt is good in one's spiritual journey. And a guilt which is based on um, a feeling that I've been given so much opportunity, but I'm not utilizing it. I've been given so many facilities, I've been given so much grace, um, but I'm not taking advantage of it. I'm not um, showing my appreciation and gratitude for what, I'm, for what I've received. And the guilt that comes from that, that's a very good guilt. Because it means that that guilt is based on appreciation, is based on understanding that what I have is of value and I should do more to reciprocate with that. So that's a very good type of guilt. But someone else's guilt may be uh, based on more material things, you know, that, oh, there are others around me, they're doing better than me, therefore I feel guilty, you know, it could be. So everyone's guilt is based on a different, a different thing, you know. Um, so it just requires us to look deeply within ourselves Number one, seeing where that guilt is coming from. And number two, to then utilize that guilt to try to do more and be more and, 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 and apply ourselves more. So, yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second one um, sort of similar to that. Um, like sometimes when you feel like you aren't doing enough, you sort of realize that maybe the spark that you had initially isn't as strong um, as it was in the start towards Krishna. So when you realize you're not doing enough, then sometimes that feeling comes that maybe my determination was not as much as I thought it to be or my attraction was not. So how do we use that to move forward? On Friday, I was mentioning to someone that when we look at our spiritual life, there's a reality of where we are and there's an ideal of how we'd like to be. And we often feel guilty when we see the gap between the real and the ideal. And we think, I should be so much more. I should be doing so much more. And that gap brings a lot of frustration and guilt. But what I was telling the devotee is that we should see how far we have to go. But we should also see how far we've also come. 
you're not the same person you were one year ago. You're not the same person you were before you started practicing Krishna consciousness. By being immersed in this process, you have already changed. You have already done so much. You have already advanced. So also be kind to yourself. Give yourself credit. Yes, you do have taste. You did give up so many things. You did make sacrifices. And maybe you could do so much more. And you could make so much more sacrifices. And it's good that you realize you have far to go. But also be kind to yourself and see how far you've come. And when you have that double uh, appreciation of how far you have to go and how far you've come, then because it's a balance, you, it won't um, impede your enthusiasm. Does that help? Yeah. Yes. In Canto 5, Chapter 26, Sukadev Goswami explains about the hellish planets. And there are 28. And then later on he says there are hundreds. And you think it's important that we read through those because when we realize for what activities we do, we have a certain destination, yes. then <coughs> it gives you an impetus to get serious. <laughs> yeah, of course, all of these things are there in Shastra, they're there for a purpose. But let me also share this with you. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he says, religion can take place on four levels. One level of religious practice is based on bhaya or fear. Higher than that is religion which is based on asha, which means material desire. Higher than that is religion which is based on kartavya, which means duty. But higher than that is religion which is based on Prema, which means love. So when we read these parts of Shastra, it can help to give us some detachment, to give us some. But this in and of itself, this fear, we're not going to go to Goloka Vrindavan because we're fearful of the hellish planets. We're going to go to Goloka Vrindavan and be with Krishna because we've fallen in love with Krishna. So... So I agree with you, every part of the Bhagavatam is useful and these chapters are also very useful because they tell us the reality. But our spiritual life ultimately should not be drawn by fear. Our spiritual life should be drawn by uh, love and that will take us to um, Krishna's smiling face. Okay. Yes. How to practice detachment from the materialistic world? Don't worry, everything will disappear anyway. <laughs> but it's good to have detachment because when it does disappear, it means it won't hurt you as much. So how to... So let me also tell you, there's different levels on which you can be detached. One level of detachment is detachment which is based on uh, knowledge. So you detach yourself based on philosophy, knowledge, that ultimately this is temporary, this is just uh, here for some time, therefore I should not be attached to it. But a higher type of detachment is not detachment which comes from knowledge, but detachment which comes from spiritual attachment. In Sanskrit, the word for detachment is vairagya. Have you heard? Vairagya means detachment. But do you know in Sanskrit, vairagya has a double meaning. Vairagya means detachment, but vairagya also means vishesha raga. Vishesha 
means special and raga means attachment so vairagya means detachment but the double meaning is that it means a special kind of attachment in other words when you become attached to krishna when you become attached to the spiritual reality when you become completely in love with something beyond this world then naturally you become detached from this world therefore krishna says vishaya vinivartante niraharasya dehina rasovarjam rasopyasya param drisht vinivartate you can give up the lower rasa the lower type of enjoyment when you have a param rasa param drishtva of higher taste so the outer way to become detached is to experience something better then the things of this world will not attract you anymore i see so many hands and i'm looking at the time i don't mind going on but i don't want to also like put the whole situation behind so what is the shall we finish here or take one or two what what should we do <laughs> put it on there. okay we'll take the last question then Yes, you get the last question. Latest by five. We can finish. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. So first, what many people talked about like why we ended up here, all the past things. So what should my question is like what should we do to escape this world? What should we do in this life so to reach spiritual life? Like to escape this material world, and what should we do in this life to reach spiritual life? So what should we do in this life so that we can achieve spiritual life? So very simple. A associate with devotees regularly. Associate with devotees deeply. Make your best best friendships with other spiritual people and help each other. First thing. B books Try to read the Bhagavad Gita, try to read scriptures every single day. Just as you take bath every day with water to clean your body, bathe in the words of the books, the shastra so you can cleanse your mind. See, chant. Chant every day. One round, two rounds, four rounds, 16 rounds. Prabhupada said, I'm telling them, chant, 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 and they're saying, can't. 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 Why? So simple. Couldn't make it easier. C. Chant every day. D. Diet. Not lose weight. You can't do that if you want to as well. Diet means offer your food to Krishna every single day. That's simple. Every day you have to eat. So just put it in front of a picture of Krishna and, and offer it with love and Krishna will accept it. And E. Engage in service. Do some seva. Come and clean the temple, serve the devotees, offer some donation to the mission of Krishna consciousness, serve, do something practical. If you do these things every single day, by the end of this life, you will have developed an attachment for Krishna. And if you develop an attachment for Krishna, you'll remember Krishna. And if you remember Krishna, antakale chama meva smaran muktva kalevaram, then you go to Krishna. So it's up to you. What, what life do you want to create for yourself? That's your decision. But if you factor these things in on a daily basis, then know that you're creating a very, very spiritual life and that your destination will be spiritual. Is that okay? D can also mean devotion. D can also mean determination. D can also mean desire. D can also mean dancing. Yeah, D can mean many things. Thank you. Okay, so I think maybe we can finish there. So thank you so much for your kind attention and uh, wishing you the best. D can also mean Dublin. So it's nice to be in Dublin and uh, I hope to see all of you again very, very soon.